All righty. Well, uh, thank you to everybody that's uh, taken time to join today's webinar. Um, myself and the rest of the presenters you'll be hearing from are excited to have you guys join and really looking forward to highlighting some of the great work that's uh, been happening over the last few months as a response to, to obviously some challenging times with COVID-19. Um, before we get going, uh, just to kind of set the stage, I know some folks may be aware and others may be not, but Cerner and Get Well Network formed a partnership within the last year. Um, this has really been anchored around both uh, a focus from Get Well and a focus from Cerner on cross-continuum strategies that obviously we have products that, that, that sit across the continuum and, and sort our, uh, support our clients to date. Um, what we've really been looking at is together, um, how do we further integrate and further um, put focus around heightened patient engagement and a positive experience, whether that is pre a visit, uh, during a visit, or, or after a visit um, for a patient. Uh, today's focus, though, will be a little bit more focused around the Get Well Loop product, and then to my lead in, uh, more around some of the great work that's been done in response to COVID. And we'll take a uh, uh, part of the time today to highlight some of the health systems that have had success using the Get Well Loop COVID offering here in the last few months. Um, we'll definitely be focused on a few different areas of how we're tackling COVID, both from an active crisis management, as well as a response of reopening and trying to get back to a level of norm normalcy. And from an active crisis management perspective, this is something that's being made available at no annual license cost to clients and really being made available for just a small one-time setup uh, to help in a time of need um, that we're obviously facing right now. So I'm hoping this time is beneficial. I hope it gives insight to how we can collectively provide uplift to your organization. And with that said, um, just a quick highlight of who you'll be hearing from today. So on uh, the next slide, um, myself, so I'm Ryan Tillman. I'm a senior solution strategist with Cerner, um, primarily in our consumer engagement space. You'll also be hearing from Olivia Davis, uh, Senior Vice President with Get Well Network, and Vicki Wickline, who is a Vice President in, at Get Well Network with Ambulatory Services and Value Re Realization. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Olivia, and we'll uh, dive into today's webinar. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, I thought I'd start with just two minutes of context on Get Well Loop and what we've been doing across the last four months. Um, so. Get Well Loop is a digital care management remote patient monitoring platform. So we digitize care plans for patients and give them the right information at the right time across over 180 different um, uh, care plans. So wide variety of clinical conditions. And if you rewind back to March, we were approached by a number of our large health system partners around how they could use the platform to address their COVID population. So both patients with active symptoms, patients that were maybe waiting on test results, their healthcare employees, how to manage them at scale. Um, and we were able to, within a week, stand up a clinical council, develop a clinical content for COVID, and get our first health system live, which was um, a blur for everyone involved, for us and for our health um, system partners. Fast forward to today, we now have over 200 hospitals live on our COVID loops representing over 100,000 patients with engagement rates of over 90%, patient satisfaction of 89% on average, and health systems being reimbursed for the work. It has also spawned um, a, a real data set that our health systems have been able to leverage to glean key insights around both their patient populations as well as um, efficacy of care, which you see called out on the right-hand side of the slide. So you can note that patients on COVID loops have been shown to offset costs by around 50%. Our health systems are now also publishing on their outcomes. If you slip to the next slide, this was our earliest study that was put out by M Health Fairview in the Twin Cities. Um, and the key takeaway, this was published back in March, um, is just how eager patients are to engage with this kind of technology. You can see that they had 91% patient satisfaction rates, 94% utilization rates, and quotes like the ones that you see on the bottom half of the slide. 
we're now going through, we're in review with our next wave of studies that our partners are putting out um, that are really focused on um, utilization rates. And some of them are showing dramatically lower hospitalization rates, which is obviously, of course, um, the objective and goal and has been um, incredibly exciting for us and for our partners to see. So if you lift up, so that's a little bit of context around what we've been doing across the last couple of months. I'd love to spend a minute on just how we see the landscape shifting, um, uh, how we see GetWell Loop fitting into other technologies organizations are investing in, and then how the platform actually works. So if you think about kind of what we thought about up until two weeks ago as the landscape, and Vicky, if you could flip to the next slide, we really were addressing this as kind of a two-phased crisis. So we had the first phase where we had organizations in active crisis management mode. Put one more slide forward, sorry. Active crisis management mode, where they were really trying to mitigate being um, uh, capacity constraints, trying to monitor and support employees and enable as much at-home care as, as possible. And then organizations were talking about um, how do we prepare for then a reopening and recovery phase where we get our, as um, we bend the curve, we get our elective surgeries back in. And then we also continue to communicate with patients that have ongoing needed care, but with really different types of care protocols. So how do we talk to our oncology patients or our moms coming in about the fact that they might have really different visitor protocols or there might be a new facility that they need to go to. All the while organizations are doing this, we're also been having a host of conversations around how organizations need to keep an eye on the investments they're making today, making sure that they actually make long-term sense for the future as well. So how do we ensure that the changes we're making are creating a sustainable platform for us as we move forward? This was a really kind of neat uh, two-part curve, but, um, uh, and I think up until a couple of weeks ago, we felt like this is relevant. But given the surges that have been happening across the last few weeks, the reality of what we're seeing in the market is a lot messier. Vicki, if you'll flip to the next slide. What we're actually seeing happen with surges is we have organizations that are re-emerging and also going through a surge at the same time. Is so they're having to really um, balance crisis management with growth at the same time. So how do we adjust our service model to mitigate capacity overload, preserve PPE? How do we manage our um, healthcare employees, which we hear is an increasing challenge? And how do we communicate policies to patients? At the same time, as we're trying to make sure that we're financially sustainable and that we are developing a long-term sustainable remote care policy. And it's this kind of balance, obviously, that we're seeing drive investment in virtual care. There has been a real push into various types of technologies. And Vicki, if you see, flip to the next slide, show you a little bit about how we see that manifesting. We see three core areas that organizations are investing in when it comes to virtual care. So first and foremost, AI, so symptom trackers, um, and one-time um, either chatbot or online forms that can be filled out. We, obviously, probably there's been the most press and biggest investment in telehealth and video visits. And then we also see organizations in both investing in remote patient monitoring. The challenge with this, as we hear CIOs tell us, is that we run the risk of replacing or augmenting a, a fractured in-person healthcare system with a fractured virtual or digital healthcare system. Um, and let me tell you a little bit about what that means. So what we run the risk of is having symptom checkers, then not talking to a patient again until they come in for a virtual visit and then not following up with them afterwards. Um, and so what Get Well Loop does is provide the connective tissue in between um, those one-time interactions with a patient so that you can be managing a patient throughout their episode. And as opposed to traditional remote patient monitoring platforms that really focus on a very narrow patient population, as I said earlier, we cover over 180 different clinical care plans, so we can cover a really wide set of patients that a given health system sees. So that's kind of the um, both the big picture of how we see ourselves fitting in and the broader landscape. I'll turn it over to Vicki to actually go through the platform in greater depth. Thank you. Okay, so a little bit more about Get Well Loop. Um, this is not a new program. We have been doing this work and serving hospitals and health systems for the past decade, a little bit over a decade now. 
Um, and really at our core, what we are is, as Olivia mentioned, we're a digital care management solution, and we are designed to engage and empower both patients and their families as they experience different episodes of care. So this can be um, a procedural episode. This can be uh, something they experience in just the discharge setting. So for example, leaving the ED, um, but this could also be something surrounding a chronic event or um, management of a chronic disease. And really how we do our work breaks down into these three verticals that are on the slide in front of you. So the first is from the patient perspective, what we're doing is automatically delivering daily touch points to patients. So these can be in the form of push notifications, they can be in the form of assessments, secure messaging, checklists, and reminders. We also incorporate a lot of patient reported outcomes into these daily interactions as well. And a combination of the different types of ways in which we engage and the cadence in which we do so with patients has really led to the statistic at the bottom here, which is that if we look across our entire cohort of patients that have been on loop for the past decade, consistently 92% of those patients say they would be extremely likely to recommend this program as provided by your healthcare organization. Now, by giving those daily touch points and really having that meaningful interaction with patients, what we're able to do on the care team side is provide that real-time window into the patient. So you, as a care team member, have actionable insights into how your patient is doing and if there's anything that that patient specifically needs. Um, what that really means is you're able to prevent last-minute complications, you're able to reduce the risk that a patient um, would cancel their case last minute. You're of course able to reduce your readmission rate um, and in turn reduce the overall cost of care uh, in order to deliver to that patient. And really here what this leads to is on the right hand side, enabling care teams to focus on the right patient at the right time. So this is really about helping uh, care teams operate at the top of their license. Um, we now have uh, the ability for individuals to be um, surfaced with the right questions from the right patients and really know when there's a patient that needs a specific question or has a specific concern for you to address. As Olivia was saying, um, we have over 180 care plans. Um, these care plans are um, very thoughtful. Many of them span several weeks long. Some of them span several months long. All of the information has already been templatized and most importantly, all of it can be customized and configured exactly to your needs. So this is at the service line level, but this could also be at the individual physician level. Uh, in 2019, we averaged about 95,000 patient check-ins per month. If we actually look at the data from 2020, this is almost doubled just with the COVID support that we've been doing um, from March onwards. Uh, the below half of the screen, we're listing some of the service lines that we cover. If I was to click into any of these service lines, what you would see on the right hand side is a full list of care plans and pathways that are available for our customers across each of these areas. So really this tool um, is in use and is intended for an enterprise wide uh, engagement. The entire point is that you would no longer need to have many different programs for many different types of engagements, but really could have all of those needs um, covered by one single platform. And it's because of this that our customers reached out to us in March and said, uh, you know, we see a lot of success with Loop and all of our other service lines, and we're now faced with a crisis that is something that we haven't had to deal with in the past. And we know that because patients have such strong engagement on Loop, if we can come together and create the right content, we'll be able to um, support those patients as we deal with COVID-19. And so that's exactly what we did. Um, we stood up a clinical council. So these were made from um, majority of clinicians and executives across our client customer base. Uh, and we worked with them to develop what we call our uh, coronavirus package. Um, there's many different plans within this package. I'll walk through a few of them, and then most importantly, I'll demo one of them for you today. Within our clinical council, uh, there were three focus areas, and this group still meets today. This is a live uh, organization, um, and their key points are first, of course, on the clinical side. So here, what we're focusing on is providing up-to-date peer-reviewed content 
making sure that the symptom tracking and monitoring is active is accurate and making sure that all of the trusted resources are coming from reliable sources so places like the cdc and the who we also have an emphasis on the behavioral side so here we are um, trying to ensure that our content helps improve patients capacity to engage so really this is about um, embedding uh, breathing exercises, embedding videos on mindfulness, uh, asking questions to assess that patient's well-being over time, and providing resources that will help patients during these key crisis moments. And then lastly, but incredibly important, is the social aspect. So this deals a lot with the tone of the language. Um, it deals with the literacy level of the content that's developed. Uh, for our Spanish-speaking patients, it um, enables them to receive the same content in there in Spanish language as well. All of this content, as I mentioned, is um, reviewed and validated. Uh, this group meets very frequently. We often make updates to our content according to guidelines. Um, and then one of the um, really neat things that Olivia touched on earlier is um, the access to clinical insights coming from this data. So because we have so many organizations that are using this program, we had mentioned over 200 facilities that are actively enrolling today. Um, it also means that we have access to this really unique data set that is going to help all of us collectively learn uh, and um, hopefully be able to deliver these clinical insights back to our cohort. So for example, one example here is that um, we've learned through our data that um, females that were on our COVID loop program reported a 28% um, more likelihood to lose um, smell or taste than males um, that were on the active symptom monitoring plan. When we think about how we are best positioned to support organizations today, there's really two buckets and uh, Olivia walked through um, both of these with the group earlier. On the right hand side, uh, it's really about how do we um, continue to support organizations that are um, still um, doing a lot of management of patients that have the virus today, that are potentially experiencing a surge, and that may continue to experience surges uh, in the near future. So for this bucket, we have a series of um, very specific and unique programs that patients can be enrolled on. There's a self-monitoring loop. So this is intended for, we'll call it the worried well patient population. Uh, you might not be showing symptoms today, uh, but you um, may be stressed, you may be anxious about this, and you may want uh, up-to-date, accurate information on how to keep yourself and your family and friends safe uh, and how to self-check for symptoms at home. Uh, the loop that is used the most by our clients right now is the active symptom monitoring loop, and this is the one that I'm going to demonstrate for you in just a minute. Um, this is really intended for individuals that either have symptoms, maybe they've received a test, um, maybe they're not symptomatic yet, but they've had exposure to someone uh, who is positive for COVID-19. And for this group, uh, while they're at home, we really want to keep a uh, close track of them to see how their symptoms are progressing over time and to be able to intervene if necessary. Uh, there is a healthcare employee loop. So this also does active symptom monitoring. The language is tailored more um, for your clinician population. So this is intended for your employees that are at home uh, and for um, employee health teams to be able to keep track of those individuals. There is a recovery program. Uh, this is intended for individuals that have been hospitalized and have now been sent home. Um, so they are likely still sick, but it is safest and best for them to continue their recovery journey at home. Um, and this is a very specific program intended for that group. And then lastly, for your pediatric patients and for their caregivers, we have our pediatric active symptom monitoring plan. Um, this does a lot of the same symptom checking, but of course is geared towards the younger audience. On the left-hand side, um, we recognize that not only are you caring for COVID patients, but you're also continuing a lot of your regular um, operations. And what that means is that you still have patients coming in for um, treatments, you still have patients coming in for elective procedures. And for those individuals, um, we have developed what we'll call them enrichment packages. 
So these are um, specific pieces of content that we can layer into any of our other 180 plus care pathways. Um, these are intended to provide general education on the virus. They allow you to do clinical screening. So for example, in a procedural area, um, if you need to complete screening to confirm that someone has received a test and the test been, has been positive, or if you need to confirm the day before coming into their procedure that they, in fact, do not have any symptoms, we can easily automate this through Loop. Um, there's a reassurance program, and this is very important. This is really intended for um, individuals who, let's say, they um, have an upcoming procedure um, and they're very nervous about it. They want to know, what are your updated visitor guidelines? Uh, is there a different entrance that they should enter in through? Um, what is your organization doing to keep them safe as they come in for their procedure? Um, and so this bucket is really intended to help organizations be able to effectively communicate that information to their patients. Uh, there's a rescheduling program. This is really for uh, if you've had elective cases that have been canceled and you're working to get back in touch with that patient to reschedule for them for that elective procedure. And then once they've been rescheduled, there's a preparedness program. Um, and so this is really designed to, uh, again, educate or provide all of the relevant information to help that patient feel really confident and be prepared leading up to um, that procedure. And then lastly, before I do the demonstration, um, I just wanna talk a little bit about how um, we've seen our customers uh, use Loop and be able to receive reimbursement uh, for remote physiologic monitoring through the Get Well Loop program. Um, so there are several RPM codes um, that we have seen be successfully used. Um, there's also several waivers uh, that are in place right now. So for example, uh, patient copay organizations have the ability to waive a copay should they choose to do so um, within um, this time period. The first one on the left, 99453, this is um, reimbursement code. It's really intended for um, reimbursing clini clinical teams for being able to educate and enroll patients on the LOOP program. And then the several codes to the right are all um, time-based codes. So they deal with um, clinical team time spent interacting with a patient after reviewing physiologic data sent via LOOP. Um, and the amount of reimbursement potential really depends on the amount of time spent and who from your organization um, was the one interacting with the patient. Um, we've seen organizations get reimbursed about $20 to $80 per month per patient, again, depending on the use of the time-based codes. And um, we've also seen reimbursement come not only from CMS, so although these are CMS codes, um, many organizations are submitting them to private and commercial insurers as well and um, those commercial insurers are following suit and also uh, reimbursing their healthcare organizations for use of these codes. Okay, I'm gonna transition now and I am going to share with you uh, a demo. So this demonstration, as I'd mentioned earlier, is gonna focus specifically on the active symptom monitoring program. I'm just gonna take you through one day of this program. It, typically, it is 16 days long. Um, we're gonna take you through uh, one of the first days in which I, as the patient, Catherine, have activated my account. So in this instance, um, I, as Catherine, um, was exposed to someone who was positive for COVID-19, but I am not yet showing um, symptoms at this point in time, and hopefully I will not show symptoms. Um, but my healthcare provider um, has decided to enroll me on uh, the COVID-19 active symptom or exposure loop to really be able to keep track of if I um, do develop any of those symptoms and may require follow-up or may require a telehealth visit or to come in to get tested across the next uh, two-week period. Most patients will choose to engage on loop using their smartphone, um, but they don't have to use their smartphone. They could use a computer, um, and really all we need is access to a web browser in order to give an individual access to Loop. Um, there is an application. Uh, you could download the application if you wanted, but most patients will choose to either receive a text message or receive an email, um, and that's how they will go through their daily check-ins. All information here um, will come branded on behalf of your organization. So 
um, the language, the logo, the colors, all of this um, we will update because we want this program to be on behalf of you in service to your patient community. There's a few things that we'll do in the beginning. So again, because this is my initial check-in, uh, it's going to be a little bit longer and we're going to have a few welcome messages. We're also going to start right away with um, identifying some emergency warning signs and educating patients as to what they are supposed to do if they do experience any of these warning signs. We're gonna ask a few questions to learn a little bit more about that patient. Um, we're only gonna ask these upfront questions once. So we wanna know how many live in their household. Importantly, we wanna know if this individual has any of the identified risk factors that um, may make them um, more susceptible to either um, develop the virus or uh, catch the virus um, or get extremely sick um, if they were in fact positive. We're also going to ask about how that individual is doing and how they're feeling beyond their physical symptoms. And again, this goes back to dealing with the whole person um, outside of just the clinical piece. Now we're gonna to start to get into the daily symptom checks. And these are similar questions that would be asked across that 14 or 16 day period of time. So first we wanna know about shortness of breath and we're gonna provide examples of what it would mean to have shortness of breath. So are you experiencing it when speaking, walking or climbing stairs? This might feel like you need to take more breaths or breathe more quickly. Now, depending how, as, how I as Catherine answer these questions, it may surface a different type of clinical alert for my clinical team to review. And I'll show you the experience for this on the clinician side, so you'll be able to see how they interact with it. We have several different types of alerts of varying severity, and there is logic built into the program where uh, if I, for example, um, identify that I am experiencing several things at the same time, that would elevate that level of risk or that level of alert for my team. Um, some patients are um, sent home with a pulse ox and they are checking their oxygen levels. And so for those individuals, we will um, want them to enter in. So the patient reported data here, um, and we will be able to monitor and um, submit alerting based on changes to that. Same for temperature. Many patients will be taking their temperature on a daily basis. We are gonna provide reminders on taking your temperature. So for example, wait 30 minutes after eating, drinking, or exercising or wait six hours after taking medication. And again, I'm just filling these in at random for now. Um, now we're gonna ask about other symptoms. So for example, a loss of appetite or stomach pain, reminders about drinking extra fluids, uh, questions about cough, And here, now we've finished the symptom checklist for the day. Um, we're gonna remind them that we are going to check in with them on a daily basis. And then at the end of the check-in, we're gonna direct them to their activity feed. So this is a wonderful resource where we're able to provide additional information beyond just those um, daily check-in questions. So here, for example, I can see access to videos. So this video is what is COVID-19. I have information on um, who to reach out to if I need help. Uh, I have information, another video on mindfulness. I have access to wonderful resources such as fact sheets. Um, these again are were developed. Many of them are coming directly from the CDC. And I can also come up here and review these resources up here as well. If I have communicated back and forth with my care team through Loop, I would also see those comments and that correspondence appear on my activity feed here. I'm gonna switch now and uh, show you a little bit of the care team experience. So I'm switching out now from Catherine, and I'm now gonna switch over to the clinician side. 
So a quick comment on um, clinician workflows. A again, we in the past couple of months have had several hundred facilities and organizations sign on to use this program, which means that we have seen a variety of different workflows. Um, there is no one correct way to manage and monitor this program. Uh, and we have been able to support many different organizations think through what would be the best workflow for that specific organization. Um, we have seen groups repurpose med students in order to act as first responders. We have seen groups use call centers. Um, we have seen groups use their primary care network and tap into their primary care network. Um, and so one of the first things that we would do with organizations that would be interested in moving forward is have a really in-depth and thoughtful conversation around workflow, around how you're managing these patients today, and around how this program um, could help uh, scale and improve that workflow or that system that is already in place. So in this instance, um, I am an MA. I have been um, assigned to be one of the individuals to help monitor Loop during this period of time. Um, the, immediately what I can see is that of the 500 patients that I have on Loop, 470 of them are on track. So they have activated their accounts, they have gone through the check-ins, um, they've not answered their questions in any way that would be considered alerting. I can see that I have um, 30 patients that have responded to a question uh, that I will want to review. So 10 of them have surfaced red alerts, these are alerts of more severity, 20 of them have surfaced yellow alerts. I might not even need to respond to a patient with a yellow alert, but it's a good um, thing to know depending on the specific reason behind the alert. I can also come down here and see a gauge for um, how engaged are my patients on this program. So a highly engaged patient, this is one who is really actively going through every single check-in, responding to every single check it, responding to every single question. A low engaged patient, maybe they're doing every single other check-in or a check-in every three days. Um, if I had time and I wanted to specifically target patients to call, I could always click on this list and it would give me a work list of those lower engaged patients and I could try to reach out to them through a different means. Same for those that have opted not to activate their account. So in this instance, I'll click into a sample patient here. I'll click into Catherine. And there's a couple things that I can see once I go into Catherine's page. So um, I can see that Catherine has been enrolled on the active symptom monitoring loop. Um, I have her phone number if I'd like to call her. And then most importantly, immediately I can see why this alert was surfaced. So this alert was surfaced for me to review because when Catherine responded to her question, she indicated that her breathing had worsened. Now there's a few things that I can do when I respond to this. I can comment directly back to Catherine and I can do that here through the comment feature. I can hand this issue off to another provider on Catherine's team if I'm not the right individual to be able to um, deal with this specific alert. Let's say I call Catherine, I can leave an internal note of that conversation. So in this instance, what I'm gonna do is I'm actually first going to hand this off to Catherine's provider. So here I'm handing this off to her provider, uh, Dr. Robbins. I'm going to send her Dr. Robbins a note with a little bit of background. So I'm going to say, Catherine checked in on loop. She does not have COVID-19 or she's not been diagnosed with it, um, but she is showing signs of increased complications with breathing. What would you like to do? Dr. Robbins responds right away through loop and says, let's schedule a telehealth visit with her today. This will help determine if she should go to our drive through testing station. I then am able to comment directly back to Catherine let her know that we've scheduled her telehealth visit and let her know um, what that means for her. Again, a very simple um, and efficient communication stream through Loop. Another thing that I can do through the program, so for organizations that have decided um, that they would like to um, bill for Loop and they would like to take advantage of the remote physiologic monitoring codes, I would come in here and I would click bill time. This would enable me to pick um, the specific code that I'm billing for, depending on um, who I am and what I've done with Catherine or the patient. I would leave a quick internal note of the interaction that occurred, and then I would submit it. This would then appear um, internally on Catherine's activity feed. So Catherine would not be able to see it, but any other clinician that's interacting with Catherine through Loop would be able to see it. Um, and therefore, you would have documentation of the interaction. It would also then summarize over here on the billing tab.
So if I click into here, I'd be able to pick the specific month, I'd be able to pick um, the insurance, I'd be able to pick the specific code, and automatically I would see summarize the amount of patients within that given time frame that are eligible for billing. And this would be a really easy list for me to then export and submit to my billing team in order to um, share for reimbursement. All right, so this covers um, what I wanted to walk through on both the patient side and the clinician side. Um, obviously, there's a lot more to loop than this, and we would love to, in a follow-up conversation for any who's interested, um, go into much more depth on any of these features or any of the associated workflows. What I'm gonna do now, though, is I'm sure that there are lots of questions dealing with um, integration, now that I've shown you how the patient work uses the program and how the clinician uses the program. So I'm going to turn this over um, to Ryan, and he's going to take through um, the various integrations that are already available, but also um, the integration uh, streams that are underway between Cerner and GetWell at the moment. Great, thank you. Um, so before diving into the integration specifically, um, I did want to take a second just to kind of outline um, Cerner's thoughts and strategy around uh, consumer engagement and ultimately what we're doing in this space, um, which is Get Well Loop is a, a key component of kind of the care aspect of what we're doing as it relates to consumer engagement. Um, so on the next slide, you'll notice across the top of the slide, we're really looking at consumer engagement and our approach across four key pillars. So um, what we have noted here, shopping, care, well-being, and outreach. And the thought being, when you look across these four pillars, there's either a very focused patient goal or a very focused organizational goal as it relates to consumer engagement and a, and a positive patient experience. Whether that be from a shopping side, you know, attracting and attaining patients into your health system through convenient provider searches and scheduling functions, whether it be digitally engaging with patients across their episodes of care. So kind of back to the connective tissue comments that Olivia made earlier, when they're not in front of you directly, how are we making sure that, that patients are, one, having a good experience, but also they're getting the right level of information and care pre and post that in-person experience? Um, and then I would say kind of an overarching theme to this, these four pillars is really beginning to end, how are we making this seamless? How are we making this convenient? And how are we creating a positive experience to where, you know, beyond that immediate visit or episode of care that a patient's going through, what is gonna make them wanna come back and continue to be a recurring uh, customer of your organization and your health system? So the way that we're approaching this is really through a few different means. Um, there will be continued advancements to the patient portal as we know it today from a Cerner perspective, but we're also layering in underlying technology such as this consumer framework. and. What I want to highlight there is it's really key to some of the partnerships that we have with Get Well Loop. So what Vicki covered um, as far as the patient experience, being able to embed that within the patient portal and, and not only surface up the things that we need to know related to Loop and that episode of care, but if I'm ultimately interacting with the portal and having other needs, whether it be scheduling, bill pay, and things of that nature, I'm doing that within one ecosystem through one centralized experience and not creating a means to go through multiple different, different channels to accomplish that. So there will be continued advancements such as the consumer framework and general capabilities. But we've partnered with Best of Breed um, partners such as GetWell, who's doing great things. And a lot of the statistics that you've heard earlier, it really centers around what we're focused on on the Cerner side from a cross-continuum care um, management perspective. So on the next slide, um, I do want to talk through when we look at 2020 and the initiatives that Get Well and Cerner have focused on, we've really broken those into two kind of swim lanes. So the patient side, which I won't spend as much time on because I, I think I've highlighted some of that, but it's really how do we embed that patient experience within the framework to where um, we're creating brand loyalty, retention, a seamless experience. We're maintaining the high activation and engagement rates that Loop's known for, but we're also promoting loyalty and retention from a patient portal perspective to where, to my earlier comment, um, I'm not only a, a one-time 
uh, customer of the health system, I'm recurring customer to where I see um, your organization as the number one provider for, for my needs as a, a, a care provider. The other aspect that Vicki covered from a loop perspective is that loop clinician dashboard and the workflows that, that GetWell's been supporting today, which in Vicki's comments, it's, there's not a one size fit all because obviously in relation to COVID, there's a ton of different ways that we're tackling COVID and whether that be MDs or whether that be through symptom checkers or telehealth presence, you know, it looks a little bit different, but the, the, the approach that we're taking together is around um, embedding that loop clinician dashboard experience into Millennium to where ultimately we're mitigating the need for us to live in two disparate systems and we're creating those insights, we're creating the visibility to alert inside the, the CERN Millennium ecosystem and reducing the burden uh, from a clinical perspective of having to, to maybe have another stop on my day-to-day -day workflow. So on the next page, what I wanted to highlight is both near-term, um, where we're at, and then a little bit of where we're going together because both conversations and activities are, are, are in full swing at this point. So for that consumer framework integration and that embedded loop experience, um, what we're looking at is kind of two, two items up front. So one, as I access um, the patient portal, having visibility to my episode of care and the loop journey that I'm on to know the, the pertinent things that I need to know face up. So do I have education and resources and things that have been made, made available to me? Do I have a check-in that ultimately I need to complete um, that, that might be based on symptom assessment questions or it just might be some general understanding such as the examples that, that Vicki walked through on an initial check-in for COVID. And ultimately what we're, what we're doing there is um, when I receive those loop check-ins, driving that patient directly to the portal to complete that check-in and immediately landing on that experience inside the consumer framework. The other aspect is not only knowing face up within the dashboard of the portal, what I need to do related to loop, but being able to launch that full experience uh, without launching out to a separate page or a separate URL or that type of experience. So clicking from the dashboard, accessing that via the navigate, navigation components within the portal, being able to complete a check-in, but also the, the highlights that Vicki made around the activity feed, being able to backtrack and, you know, kind of reverse chronological order, see all the things that I've done, I've had provided to me, see the care team communications that I've had. And then if I have to-dos or, or, or checklist items that are maybe more time sensitive, being able to complete those inside the framework without ever, ever having to leave. Um, one key component that I do want to call out is similar to, to Loop as a standalone perspective is this is something that we're able to support from a traditional computer desktop URL experience, but we're also supporting this from a mobile responsive design um, experience as well. So if you're like me or like, like most, most folks and your phone is your means of getting things done, uh, whether that's Apple or Android, being able to complete that um, in a mobile responsive design uh, approach. On the clinical side, I, I touched on the fact that we're really focused around that smart app integration and really the, the, the driver of that being one pane of glass that a clinician works through. And I, I want to go one layer deeper as to where that would fit into Millennium. You know, if I'm a role that ultimately might interact with Loop on a less frequent basis, potentially that's adding this from a table of contents perspective. Or if I'm someone such as a first responder, a, you know, a care manager, care navigator, a nurse, um, someone that, that's interacting with Loop very frequently, embedding that within my traditional Millennium work list to where not only am I completing the things that I do to date, but Loop's readily available for me to interact with and to check on patient context. And kind of the third layer would be the organizer level within Millennium. So maybe I'm not looking at, um, you know, specific patient context related to loop and ultimately how someone's doing on their journey, but I'm looking at the view that Vicki showed around the population that I'm managing. So out of those 500 patients, readily be able to see inside of Millennium, here's the folks that are engaging at the right level and ultimately on track how we would hope they would be. And here's the folks that are maybe um, not as engaged as we would hope and potentially that's a prompt for me to reach out and and you know 
ask them if there's something that we can provide to maybe get them on the right track. Outside of the engagement, the same things that Vicki highlighted, the same type of visibility around alerting. So out of those 500 patients that I'm managing, who are the folks that are doing well and, and being managed via more of an automated process? And who are the, the folks that have maybe generated a yellow or a red alert? They either I need to communicate through the loop platform within Millennium, or I might need to pick up the phone and make a phone call and have a, a more immediate conversation with that person and guide them to the next level of care. So these are things that are very much in our windshield, um, but I want to take a, a moment to highlight future conversations that we're, are, we're in full swing on as well. So when we think of the clinical side, um, I think the opportunity for deeper continual integration together and our partnership offers this is, is on the table. So when we think of the patient care team communication aspect, a lot of um, your clinical users within your organization are going to be familiar with Message Center. And not only would we be able to surface communications via the Loop Smart app within Millennium, but moving towards the opportunity to surface those communications or potentially surface those alerts via Message Center to where I kind of have two channels of drawing my attention as a clinician to the patients I need to interact with. Um, and that could be at an individual inbox level or if, you know, you're more of a care management by committee approach where we have multiple care managers aligned to a service line or aligned to a particular provider, um, maybe going the pool route um, based on your organizational approach. I think the other uh, opportunity that, that's really helpful for us in a, in a partnership approach is enhancing the enrollment triggers that we use to date. So knowing that there's a, a Fire API ecosystem that Cerner supports that has a lot of information around clinical data elements, how do we start to use richer clinical data elements to determine out of those 180 plus care plans, who's most appropriate to land on a particular care pathway or a care plan based on items that we have um, available to us to, to drive those triggers. Um, and, and just to, to highlight a little bit further, you know, alerting's a big, a big focus. So, um, you know, there's a broad array of things that, that, you know, clinicians are focused on around risk and risk gratification and risk awareness, whether it be remote device connectivity um, that, that surface through Cerner's observation notifications component, we're exploring what is the opportunity to not only look at device trends for biometric devices, but also include uh, patient response data that would generate alerts into um, native Millennium components, such as the observation notification component. So really what that allows us to do is see a more comprehensive picture of the, the, the experience for a patient and ultimately what are they trending um, maybe a negative direction on either device related or through the responses that they provide and what are those contributing signs and symptoms that have led to those alerts being generated. So um, as I'm sure you guys are thinking, there's, there's a lot of opportunity and our teams are, you know, day to day, week to week, um, community, you know, working through these things. So I think there's a lot that we'll continue to do together and already are doing together um, that we're, we're excited about and hope to have a chance to, you know, speak with you all um, outside of this webinar more in depth, but um, I will hand it over to Vicki just to give a little insight around what does um, the deployment look like from the, the, the COVID offering that we've, you know, covered today, and what are some of those key decision points um, that we'd be making together. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, I, as I'm sure you know, um, Speed is one of the most important things for when we're dealing with COVID-19. And so our, our team has really done everything that we can to um, make the implementation process as easy and as fast as possible. Um, our average timeline from initial conversation to go live is about one week long. Uh, and so in order to achieve that, there's a few things that we do within this rapid implementation. Um, the first is we work with you to choose the appropriate care plan or care plans that would best fit your patient community and your clinician's needs. Uh, then, uh, and this would be the piece that requires the most conversation, of course, would be to determine the appropriate workflow. Um, so to work with you to understand how you're interacting with these patients today and how this program can help your current teams. Um, from there, we also would make sure that the branding is accurate. Um, and that the, your user preferences are accurate so that every individual is notified of um, what they need to do through Loop um, according to their own preferences. 
Uh, the enrollment and the end user training is actually quite simple. Um, it's a very easy program to use. Uh, and so we do have all of our training recorded. We also hold one-on-one -on -one sessions via a remote fashion as well to make sure that all teams who are in loop are very comfortable and very familiar with how to use it. And then lastly, um, of course, we support Go Live and um, we provide ongoing um, client services support for you as well. So um, every organization that uses Loop has a dedicated implementation program manager. They also have a dedicated client services manager that works directly with you to do reporting, uh, to make sure that, um, to do continued training and to make sure really that you're getting everything that you need out of the program. So in terms of next steps, um, for groups that are interested in uh, getting started, again, it's very simple. Um, we would just like to schedule a call to learn more about your needs and learn more about how we can support you. You could do this either by emailing your Cerner account executive or by reaching out to the unique email address below. It's covid19help at getwellnetwork.com. And we're also happy to send out a copy of the slides or schedule follow-up demonstrations if helpful. Um, so thank you all so much for joining today um, and we look forward to uh, hearing from you on this. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you.